Hey, um, turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. If you don't have one, you are going to need one. Throw your hands up in the air. Thank you guys for showing up at the six, in particular not in the morning, extra like rewards in heaven for you guys. And uh, thank you, seriously. Mark 12, if you are new, my name is John Mark. Welcome, we are in a series on Jesus. And right now we are looking in particular at the teachings of Jesus, what he says about life on planet Earth. And we're gonna jump right into Mark chapter 12 where we read about, in his own words, the most important of all the teachings in the Bible. Here's the plan, let's read the text, pray, and jump right back in line by line, all right? Here we go, Mark 12, skip down to 28. Let's stand up out of reverence and respect for God's word and read. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Let's pray. God, as we study these words, called by you the greatest commandments, we ask you to please really reach down into the souls of your people. Open up eyes and minds and hearts and ears to your word and speak over us with your prophetic, spiritual speaking voice. Jump into the lives of your people Help us to know what your word says and turn around and live out these teachings. In Jesus' name, the people said? Okay, take a seat. Let's jump back in and walk through the text, kind of line by line, back to 28. One of the teachers of the law, some of your Bibles say experts in the law or scribes, These scribes were a really sharp, educated class inside Judaism, employed by the temple, who were experts in the Torah. If you are new to the Bible, the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are called the Torah in Hebrew, the language of the Old Testament, or law or teachings in English, also known as the Pentateuch or the books of Moses. And the scribe's job was to know every nook and cranny of the Torah and to siphon out and extrapolate all the interpretations and rules and regulations and different meanings of the text. Think of scribes as like ancient biblical lawyers slash theologians. And one of these scribes comes to Jesus and the text says, heard them debating. If you go back and read Mark 12, Jesus in context is debating about theology with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, which is a shorthand way of saying he blows the most educated, brilliant thinkers inside Israel out of the water with his arguments. He asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? There was a huge kind of debate raging in the first century about which one of the commandments in the Torah, in the Bible, was the most important. In the Torah, in the first five books alone, there are 613 commandments in English or mitzvot in Hebrew. 248 of these mitzvot or positive, thou shalt, and 365 are negative, thou shalt not, one for every day of the year, right? 
Now, not only that, but on top of the 613 mitzvot in the Torah were another 1,500 commandments in something called the Mishnah, the rabbinic oral tradition superimposed over the top of the scriptures by the rabbis. Now, at some point, when there are not hundreds, but thousands of different commandments and rules and regulations, you start asking questions like, and I quote, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Like narrow everything down to one or two or three. I think in today's language, you could rephrase the question, what really matters? What is the center? What is God after? What is God asking for from his people? Or what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is my purpose for breathing and waking up in the morning? And these questions really are the question, which is why Jesus answers. The most important one, 29, answered Jesus, is this, and he quotes Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. Not that you're asking, but here's the second, and he quotes from Leviticus. There is no commandment greater than these. These two mitzvot, these two commandments, Jesus says, are really the center of the entire Bible. In Matthew's gospel, um, from a different angle, same story, Jesus adds, all the law and the prophets hang on these two mitzvot. The entire Bible from Genesis to Malachi hangs on, depends on, revolves around, orbits around these two commands and mitzvot and teachings. Love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, when Jesus says, listen, these two are what's really important. These are the center. These are really profound. I think we would be wise to slow way down and stop and pay tons of attention to every word. Are you with me? Which means we're gonna take the next two weeks on these two mitzvot. This weekend, let's unpack the first one. Turn back in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter six. We are going to the Torah. Deuteronomy, yes, somebody here is excited, thank you. Deuteronomy chapter six. Anybody here never read Deuteronomy? Not going to make fun of you, I promise. Yeah, okay, you're gonna enjoy yourself. Deuteronomy 6, if you know the scriptures, comes right after Moses finishes giving the 10 commandments, right? Try to erase Charleston Heston out of your memory right now. (laughs) Finishes giving the 10 commandments and all of the Mosaic law, all of the rules and regulations and stipulations for the ancient Hebrews and the people of God. Now, Deuteronomy 6 is called by the rabbis Moses' sermon on the law or the Torah. In chapter six, he stands up when he's done in front of the entire nation of Israel and inspired by the Holy Spirit, he speaks over Israel these words. Now, if you skip down to four, verses four and five, he says something famous. In fact, some of the most well-known words in all of ancient literature, the words Jesus quotes. Now, these two verses, are called the Shema or the Great Shema because the opening three words are hear, O Israel. Here in English is Shema in Hebrew. The Great Shema is the great hearing, the great way of saying, all right, everybody, listen up. What I'm about to say is really important. Hear, O Israel, people of God, Moses says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The text can be translated, Yahweh is God and him only, or the Lord is alone, nobody like him. Keep in mind, if you rewind back to 1500 BC and immerse yourself in ancient Mesopotamia, people believed in many gods. The gods of the moon and the sun and the stars and the rivers and the rocks and the trees and the crops and women and men and sexuality and fertility and so on and so forth. But here comes Moses and the Hebrews claiming God speaks to us and God says he is one. 
saying there is one God who is the creator who made everything. All these other gods, these lesser gods, in today's language, angels and demons and spiritual forces and powers and the language of the New Testament, principalities, all of these other gods are underneath the one true God who made everything in the world. And his name is the Lord. The Lord in English, capital L-O-R-D, is Yahweh in Hebrew, the personal name of the creator. This God has a name. This God is not some force, some ambiguous idea like God is to lots of people. This God is a person. This God is Yahweh. He is one. He made everything in the universe. He is creator. We are creation, which is why Moses' next words, I think, are really stunning. He says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God. What the one true creator God wants from his people is love. Not temples, not sacrifice and blood and religious systems and rules and obligations, but the one true creator, what he asks for from his people is love. There is one God, he is creator, he is Yahweh. Love the Lord your God. Now, the word love in the Hebrew, the language of the ancient scriptures is ahaba. Can you say ahaba? Yes, absolutely. Now, ahaba is deep, soulmate, passionate love used all over the scriptures of romantic love between a man and a woman used in the Song of Solomon. Your love is stronger than fire. Your ahaba, the text says. In fact, all over the Jewish scriptures, the relationship between Yahweh and the Hebrews, God and his people, is likened to that of a man and his lover or a husband and his wife. God is in love with his people in something called by theologians and mystics the divine romance. The give and take, the back and forth between creator and creation. Now here's the problem. When I hear God's in love with humanity and love the Lord your God, it kind of weirds me out because I think of love in the terms of modern American culture, right? When I hear the word love, I think of Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan, right? (laughs) Or Edward and Bella for some of you. Not me, but some of you. Um, I mean, I think of love in the terms of chemistry and sex and love and emotions and feelings and euphoria and highs and oh, and Cupid and whatever. When God says ahava, oh, he means something different. He means covenant faithfulness. He means loyalty. When he says love the Lord your God, he's not saying be Twitter pated by me, right? or some emotional, ecstatic, you know, high all the time. (gasps) High on God, right? What he means is yes, be passionate about me. Yes, be intimate with me. Yes, know me. But in the sense that you are faithful to me and loyal till death do us part. Like God is faithful to us and loyal to us. We are locked in intimate, lifelong, loving relationship with the living God. What God wants from you and me is love. God wants you to know him. Why am I here? To know the living God. It is written in the book of Revelation. You, God, created all things and for your pleasure they exist and were created. We were created for the pleasure by the will of God to know the living God and live in love and relationship and intimacy and ahava, loyalty and faithfulness with him. And here's how the text goes on to say, love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart. heart. Now, the word heart in Hebrew is lebab. Can you say lebab? Your lebab, if you are taking notes, is your inner being, your consciousness, 
your thinking and your feeling. Now track with me, heart in English means your feeling and kind of no more. Heart in Hebrew means your thinking and your feeling, mental and emotional, both and. The heart to the ancient Hebrews was the seat of your thoughts and of your emotions. Here are some examples with your finger in Deuteronomy. Turn back to Genesis chapter six. Let's read some examples of the Hebrew word lebab in the scriptures. Genesis six is the first time we read heart in the Bible, skip down to verse five. Everybody awake, doing okay? Three of you are, great. Genesis six, skip down to five. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that, notice the language, every inclination of the thoughts of his heart, I repeat, the thoughts of his heart, his thinking, was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and his heart, God's heart, was filled with pain. His feeling, thinking, thoughts of his heart and feeling filled with pain. Turn over to Psalm 139 in the middle of your Bibles. Psalm 139. Hundreds of years later, David speaks and he speaks some really kind of raw prayers out to God. And at the end of Psalm 139, he prays, if you skip down to Psalm 139, verse 23. David prays, search me, O God, and know my, what? Heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Anxious, the emotional thoughts, the mental, thinking and feeling. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I love David's prayer, I rip him off all the time. God, something's not right in my heart, in my inner being, in my thinking and my feeling. Free me from what's out of rhythm with you and lead me in the way, purify me, lead me in the way everlasting. Now, back to the Shema, Deuteronomy 6. When God says, love me with all your heart, he means with what's inside you. What's in the back of your head, your thinking, your thoughts, your mental patterns, your imaginations, your dreaming, what goes on in your head all day long. And your feeling, your emotions and desires and moods and all these pieces of who you are, your insides, why? Because everything in humans flows from the inside out. Jesus puts it this way, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks meaning everything comes from inside you, which is why the Hebrews called the heart the well. Because like the well in the center of the village, all you are springs up from inside your thinking and your feeling, your consciousness, your inner being. God says, listen, love me on the insides. Meaning he's after more than religious observance. He's after more than going to church once or twice a month, he's after going He's after more than the externals. He's after what's going on where nobody sees your thought life, what's going on in your heart, what's going on deep inside of you. Love me there. Love me in the back of your head as you are driving down 217. Love me in your heart as you are dealing with pain and loss and tragedy. Love me on the insides. But not only that, love the Lord your God, Moses says, with all your heart and with all your soul. Now, the word soul in Hebrew is nefesh. Can you say nefesh? You are scholars, right? Now your nefesh, if you are taking notes, is your life force your identity, what animates you from the inside out, your soul is called by theologians the I or the you. Your soul is the deep, mystic pieces of who you are. Your soul is what makes you, you. With your finger in Deuteronomy, turn back to Genesis chapter two. Let's read the first time nephesh is used in the scriptures. Genesis two, skip down to verse seven. We read the Lord God, Yahweh, same God, the one with a name. 
formed the man, created, built the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Prior to God breathing life into Adam, he was a corpse. Nothing was wrong with his body, his brain, his skeleton, his nervous system, his organs, everything was in order, but he was lifeless and dead and impotent until God breathed life into him and he stands up and becomes a living nephesh or being or soul, depending on your Bible. Your soul is what animates you. Your soul is what makes you tick. I like to think of the soul as the engine of the body, meaning your soul is what drives you, what moves you, what propels you through the universe. Your soul is what you are after, what you are pursuing, what you are chasing down, what is ultimate to you. Which is why you hear people say, when people are burnt out or depleted or worn down, you hear things like, my soul is tired and running on empty. And when people are spilling over with life and joy and vitality, you hear things like, my soul is alive, or my soul is awake because something is moving you and pushing you and energy is flowing from the inside out. Now you can always figure out what somebody is passionate about, what's driving somebody, what's pushing somebody day by day. I have learned, my dad's the master at this, and I've learned from him as the Padawan of how to deal (laughs) with people who are not talkative, no matter how hard you try. You know what I'm talking about? Hi, how are you? What's your name, Joe? (laughs) Awesome. How's your day going? Okay. All right. Um, Where do you work? Okay. I have learned... Everybody has something they are passionate about. And if you can figure out what Joe is passionate about, he will not stop talking. You cannot shut him up. Now, if you figure out he's really passionate about table tennis or whatever, right? And you open your mouth and you speak the words table tennis and he lights up and he stands up and he's on the edge of his seat and he's speaking and he won't shut up and and everything in him is passionate about table tennis or whatever. I hope not. If your name is Joe and you like table tennis, we pray for you and that was prophetic over your life. Repent. But um, if your name's not Joe and you, never mind. So my point here is every one of us has something we are really passionate about. Something drives you, something moves you, something, when you hear those words, you light up and you are, you are animated about what is going on. When God says, love me with all your soul, he's saying, listen, make me your ultimate. Make me what you are passionate about. Make me what you are in pursuit of. Keep in mind, built, created as humans for God, for his pleasure. But what happens is sometimes, God, who was designed to be ultimate in the lives and the hearts and the souls of his people, gets moved off center to the side, shoved to the side, and creation takes the place of creator. Things, stuff, junk, not always bad things, take the place of God himself. To love him with your soul is to push those things away and replace God in the center of your life, God as ultimate, God as your pursuit, suit God as what is driving you forward day by day. But not only that, he goes on to say, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Some of your Bibles say might. The word in the Hebrew is mehod. Can you say mehod? Now, there are two layers to your mehod. The first layer is your body or your physicality. Keep in mind, the Bible teaches you are kind of composed of two different pieces, the immaterial and the material. The immaterial is your heart and your soul and your memory and your thinking and your emotions and your feelings and dreams and desires, and the material is your arms and your legs and your lungs and your backbone and everything about you. Both are you, both were created by God. Keep in mind, there's tons of really unbiblical 
really not correct language about God and, and about the body and about physicality and creation floating around circles inside the church. We live in Western European culture, which as you know, is really the product of two things, Judeo-Christian ethics and Greek philosophy. And if you rewind back the clock, in the fourth century BC, the Greek philosopher Plato taught many things which we believe to this day, some of which are true, some of which are not. And he taught there is a immaterial world, or what he called a spiritual world, not what the Bible means by spiritual. And there is a material world. The spiritual world, he said, is what really matters, meaning the invisible, immaterial one. The physical one is not. Therefore, the spiritual world is good and true, and the physical world is evil. Now, he divided humans into the soul and the body and says your soul is trapped in your body. He called the body the prison house of the soul because your soul is stuck in your body in the evil, corrupted, physical universe where you are waiting for death when you are freed from the prison of your body and your soul goes to a place he called heaven where you live in disembodied bliss up in the clouds with the gods. Now Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, said something very different. He said, yes, there is a soul, so to speak, and a body. Yes, there is an immaterial piece to you and a physicality and material piece to you, but both were created by God, and both are you. When you hear people say things like, you know, this body is not who I really am. What Bible are you reading? What? <laughs> What is your body, my prison house? No, Paul said your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit because God lives inside you and your heart and your soul and your insides lives inside of your body. He said, yes, at death, the soul is ripped away from the body and goes to heaven to be with the creator, absolutely, but that's not the end of the story like we talked about Easter. At resurrection, when Jesus comes back and he raises from the dead his followers, your soul is reconnected with your body and you live not in spiritual bliss off in the clouds, but here on the earth made new by the work of Jesus and what Jesus calls the renewal of all things because when God made the world, he said, it is what? Good. And yeah, everything's out of whack right now, but he's piecing everything back together. Now my point is simply this. Plato said, your body is a prison house. Paul, your body is a temple. Who's right? Paul. Now you're in church, which means you have to say Paul, but <laughs> I'm going with Paul. Your body is God's, is God's temple. Now the ramifications and implications of what's called holistic salvation in theology, meaning Jesus dies to save all of you, Jesus dies to save your soul and to save your body, to save your mind and your memory and your heart and your hair follicles and those that are missing we pray for and <laughs> hope for resurrection, right? <laughs> Jesus dies to save all of you. There, there are tons of implications we don't have time for. Some simple observations. God calls us to care for the body just like God calls us to care for the soul. Both are you, both are created by God, and both feed off of one another, right? Which is one of the reasons that you guys know and make fun of me, and, which is well-deserved, but I'm semi-passionate about health and people caring for the body because I've watched how it influences the soul. You know, I talk to people who stay up till three in the morning and eat fourth meal at Taco Bell and wake up after three hours of sleep and drink nine cups of coffee and four Mountain Dews and read the Bible and wonder why God's not speaking to me. <laughs> like, yeah, right? Or people who are passionate about physical fitness and wake up at four in the morning and run 95 miles and work out and ooh, 24 hour fitness in the mirror and yeah, and all that. <laughs> and rush to work eating spinach and pine nuts and don't take time to read the Bible and wonder, why isn't God speaking to me? Why is my spiritual life? Like, like both feed off of one another. We are called by God to care for the soul and for the body. My wife roped me into, you women have a way with men, I do not know. My wife roped me into running a half marathon with her this coming July. Anybody? Guys, if your wife comes to you and says, hey, babe, let's run a half marathon, here's what you say, no. <laughs> uh, how many of you run a half marathon at any point? All right, yeah, I'm realizing 
The reason about 3% of you are raising your hands is because it's really hard. I'm training, right? I ran 12 miles on Friday, which is not half bad, I don't think. Yeah, thank you. I'm not bragging, no. My point here is I am shocked at the life, extra exercise, and I already run and stuff like that. I don't work out very much, which is obvious, but I'm shocked at how much life extra exercise is breathing into me. You know, I'm teaching right now five times on the weekend, two times on Saturday nights downtown, twice here in the morning, another time back here on Sunday nights. This fall, I think we're going back to four gatherings on the west side because we are out of space here in the mornings, um, which means we're going to six. And I love my job, absolutely love my life, but the weekends are, to be honest, really hard and long. I'm trying to figure out how to kind of, you know, cope and, and, and be coherent when I stand up here. And I'm realizing, God is really using extra exercise in my life to help me walk in what he's called me to do. My point is simply, we love God with the soul and with the body because both were created by God. Are you with me? Now the second layer to meho, not only your body and your physicality, but here's where the rubber really meets the road and track with me, what you do with your body. Your mehod is your capacity, your latent potential, the energy inside you when you take the teachings of Jesus and you live out those teachings in your body. Tons of the teachings of Jesus you obey not in the immaterial but in the material on planet Earth, in physicality, to love God with all your strength is yes, care for your body like you care for your soul, blah, 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 thank you. But also to live out the teachings of Jesus in your body, to borrow from Jesus' own words, he who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, like we talked about, hearing and doing acting out, incarnating the teachings and the mitzvot and the commands of Jesus is loving him with all your strength. Now, the Shema, this famous Jewish prayer, says, love the Lord your God, live in intimate relationship with him, creator, with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. Now, that said, back to Mark chapter 12. Stay with me, not done yet. Mark 12 in your Bibles. Some of you thinkers right now are connecting the dots and realizing Jesus does something profound back in the story. Mark 12, skip back down to 30 and let's read one more time how Jesus quotes the Shema. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your, and he says, with all your what? Mind and with all your strength. Okay, wait, drop, stop everything. Shema, Deuteronomy 6, famous Jewish prayer. God says, love me with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Jesus, years later, quotes the Shema and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Three and four, he adds one. Because when you're Jesus, and Jesus, and because when you're Jesus and you're quoting the Bible, why not throw in some extra words once in a while, right? Seriously, Jesus adds to the Torah. Okay, first se- you don't have to be a rocket science to figure out in the first century, in Judaism, you don't add words to the Bible. And everybody knows in Jesus' day the Shema. The Shema to this day is prayed by Orthodox Jews two times a day in the morning when the sun is rising, in the evening when the sun is slipping away, on Shabbat at the opening of the synagogue. I mean, the Shema is center to the Jews. Nobody would have missed what Jesus is doing. Not the scribe, not the disciples, not people eavesdropping and listening in. Nobody would have missed. What Jesus does here is really provocative. He quotes the Bible, he adds to the Bible because he's Jesus, and he says, love the Lord your God with all your mind. Why? I think because if you go back and you read chapter 12, In context, Jesus is debating with the Pharisees about Caesar and taxes and the empire, with the Sadducees about bodily resurrection and the new heavens and the new earth. 
He is arguing theology and in some intellectual kung fu, he outsmarts the most brilliant minds of his day with his mind. The scribe, who's educated, smart, knows the Torah, hears Jesus answer, the text says, meaning his arguments against these thinkers, and is really moved and says, okay, Jesus, what's your take on the greatest commandment? When Jesus quotes the Shema, he adds the mind. Now the Greek word, now we're into the New Testament, Greek is the language of the New Testament. The Greek word for mind means the same for the most part as English. Kind of your mental faculty, logic, reasoning, your, your thinking ability. When you love God with your mind, you are flexing and stretching and working out your intellectual muscles in order to know the living God. Um, One of the reasons I love what Jesus does here is because I think there is a real, subtle, but real undercurrent of anti-intellectualism inside some circles of Christianity and spirituality in general, which really baffles my mind, to be honest. Lots of Christians I rub shoulders with really think the heart is more important than the mind, which is absolutely not true in the words of Jesus. Jesus says, listen, yeah, the heart really matters to God, and the mind really matters to God. Both were created by God, and we love God with both. God calls us to love him with the heart and emotions and feelings and singing, music in church and tears, those of you that are criers, I'm not, but with your heart, and God calls us to love him by reading and learning and study everything from theology and doctrine and the Bible and the scriptures down to chemistry and microbiology and finance and economics and logic and reasoning and philosophy and history. God calls us to love him. If you go back and study Western European history, I wish we had an extra 20 minutes right now, we don't. But if you go back and study the history of where most of us are from, It was Jesus followers, I would argue, and most historians would argue, who really sparked all of the great mountains of culture, education, and economics, and government, and science, and technology, and art, and music, all of these, for the most part, were led by Christians, science in particular. All the great scientists of history, for the most part, were followers of Jesus. Because science was based on the fact, the belief, the faith, there is a God who created the world and we know him by reading his word and by learning from his creation. And when we study microbiology and chemistry and physics and math and algebra and the world around us, we learn about the creator because we are looking at the fingerprints of the living God. God and science are not at war. God created science. He built rationality into the minds of his people and he called his people to love him with all your what? Your mind. Those of you who work in science and academia, we celebrate what you are doing with your life. You are living an act of worship. Maybe one of the ways you worship this coming week is by singing music to Jesus. Maybe one of the ways you worship is you go out and you study chemistry, or you read philosophy, or you study theology, or you read some book and your head hurts and you love your God with all your mind. All of these are ways we love God. Now, here's the point before we move on. Notice he says, he speaks of these four kind of areas, heart, soul, mind, strength. Notice he prefaces everyone by saying with how much of your heart? How much of your soul? How much of your mind? How much of your strength? All. Not some, not most. The text can be translated, love the Lord your God with your whole heart, your whole strength, your whole, with all you are. I would argue the list here is not comprehensive. He's not saying, there are other areas of your, of your life Jesus asks for love. What Jesus is saying here is, listen, God is after all of you. Not some of you, not most of you, all of you. Not your spiritual life, but all of your life. One of my favorite truths 
in the Bible is the fact there is no word for spiritual in the Hebrew language. Which means if you look up spiritual in your Bible, in between Genesis and Malachi, it's not there. And the word spiritual in the New Testament does not mean what the word means in English. Something very different, whole nother sermon. Why? Because to Jesus and God and the biblical authors, everything is spiritual. Everything was created by God. And when he made the world, he said, it is good. And everything in your life matters to God. I hear people say things like, my spiritual life. I'm always wondering, what in the world is your spiritual life? Seriously, what are you talking about? You mean your relationship with God? God cares about all of your life. One of the greatest lies to ever infect the church was what's called by theologians the sacred secular divide, which lots of Christians buy into. The false belief, the false idea, some things are sacred and other things are secular. Some things are important to God, like reading the Bible and prayer and church and blah, 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 but other things, like mowing your lawn and designing software at Intel and are, are, are secular and are not really important. Now here's the problem. One is the Bible, okay? But two, the problem is most of your life by those terms is secular. You buy into the lie, some things are sacred, some things are secular. Okay, where do you work 50 hours a week? You work at Intel or Nike or Adidas or Starbucks or Pete's if you are filled with the Holy Spirit or, um, <laughs> or you're raising kids or you're teaching third grade or you're trying to survive 10th grade or whatever, right? And most of your life becomes secular. I mean, if sacred is reading the Bible and going to church, okay, there's about what? You know, four hours of your week, unless if you're mean, like 85 hours a week because you're crazy godly, you know, obviously. <laughs> I was joking, laugh, give me a break. Yeah, I wake up at three every morning and pray for four hours. No, I don't, all right? <laughs> you, you're like, you don't? No, I'm sorry. I'm leaving your church. Okay, God bless you. Wake up really early tomorrow. <laughs> oh, we don't want you here anyway. Um, back to, <laughs> ah, it's my fifth one, guys. Show me some grace, all right? I went... <laughs> oh. The problem is all of your life, or most of your life, becomes secular, which is why God says, listen, no, everything matters to God. Now, don't get me wrong. Some things are more important than others. Absolutely, reading the scripture is more important than mowing the lawn, right? But everything matters to God. Everything was created by God and for him. You, your marriage, your family, your money, your front lawn, everything was made by the living God. He calls us to love him by reading the scriptures and study and reading theology and knowing his word and thinking and worship and singing and prayer and church and being with believers and praying for one another and mowing the lawn and pulling the weeds and paying your bills and going to work and designing software and building houses and making love to your wife and raising your kids and drinking a warm cup of coffee to the glory of God. Everything about your life is spiritual. Everything matters to God because God made you and he made all of you for himself. The problem when you think you have a spiritual life, you end up thinking, all right, God, here's my spiritual life. I'm holding on to everything else. God, here's, you know, church and reading the Bible, you know, four, five, six hours a week, but, you know, I'm holding on to everything else. Jesus says, no, 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 I'm after all of you. I'm after you tomorrow morning when you wake up on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. I'm after you when you're in your cubicle, when you're driving down the road, when you're making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for your kids, when you're walking through your neighborhood and talking with your neighbor. I am with you in all those moments and everything, the most menial, the most mundane, the most physical of tasks become acts of worship and love to the living God. He's after all of you, which is why the story ends in 32. With the scribe hears what Jesus says and says, well said, teacher. The text can be translated, 
Brilliant, in the words of the Brits, or beautiful or amazing, the man replied. You are right in saying that God is one, there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, notice he swaps the Shema's soul for Jesus' mind, and with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, now here are the really intriguing ending words, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Why does Jesus say you are not far from the kingdom of God as opposed to you are not or you are in the kingdom of God? I think because the man knows because of Jesus What really matters, the man knows, okay, these are the two most important mitzvot, but it remains to be seen, will he act on what he knows? The story leaves you hanging. The story leaves you wondering what happens to the scribe. Does he obey, does he not? Does he buy into what Jesus says? Does he love God with all his heart? Or or does he walk? What happens to the man? We have no idea, why? Because the end of the story is really a question for us. The story is about us. You are the man in the story. I am the man in the story. The story ends with God saying, listen, you are not far from my kingdom. Now you know what really matters, now you know what is, center, you are not far, the question remains, will you enter the kingdom of God? Some of you are on the edges and the margins and the outskirts of God's kingdom, peering in and curious and maybe interested, but holding on to something, idols or false gods or things or stuff, something, maybe bad, maybe not, but something holding you back, something not allowing God to be ultimate, and in order to step into his kingdom, you need to peel your fingers off and drop those things and step into God's kingdom with nothing in your hands but faith and love. May you, this coming week, may I, may we, love the Lord our God with all the heart and all the soul and your whole mind and your whole strength. Let's end by reading these words of Jesus out loud, right up here, read with me. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Let's pray.